Ursula, what is your preference? Do you want to um, do that in case Lindy doesn't show up or? I can do that since her slides are right before mine. Would okay. it feel a little bit smoother than like you going, me going, and then back to you? And they kind yeah, of, yeah, they kind of mesh with the ones that I'm presenting as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both. Okay. Six. But there's five. Lindy. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Lindy. All right. Okay. Okay, it's six o'clock. Welcome everybody. I see a lot of the board members are here already. And we have 27, I'll say, well, 27 including board members, participants. It's exactly six o'clock. And we'd like to welcome you to our forum, our community budget forum. It's an informational forum so you can learn more about budget. Uh, the expectations for today for conduct, there, uh, as we always say at this meet, at this community forums, there uh, there are no wrong questions. Please be inclusive of everybody's opinion, and let's we're going to keep it brief because we're going to have a long meeting today. So let's just be kind to each other, and let's get started, uh, Mark. Um, Mark, are you with me? Do you want to start up the the presentation? Sorry, I, I'm getting there. A few too okay. many things no, on one no, screen. No, no, no worries. Coming up. No worries. It will give time for other people to come. Yeah. Are you able to see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. There we are. Thank you, Mark. So as I was saying, this is our budget forum for 22-23, and our budget was built on, on student needs. We want to underscore that uh, every budget should be uh, grounded in our mission statement, uh, and budgeting is really a year-round process. We are still working on getting there, but all the numbers in this budget uh, tell a story about what we believe is important. Uh, next slide, Mark. As I was saying, the, this budget is, is grounded in an admission statement, and Washington Central exists to nurture and inspire in all students the passion and creativity and the power to contribute to their local and global communities. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So this budget reflects our commitment to meeting our students and staff social and emotional needs and to highlight the quality, quality instruction and interventions. As the staff presented through the fall to us, we continue to experience a, a different performances between various groups of students, such as students who qualify for free and reduced lunch and students who don't, and students who qualify for IEPs and students who do not. Uh, we are addressing those concerns in this budget. Uh, Common priorities across all the three groups for 2022 and 2023 include full-time counselors and nurses. We are focusing on equity in a common understanding of our multi-layer system of supports. Next slide, please, Mark. Here are our school board parameters, and, and as you can see, we see leader, the you can see the alignment between the leadership team and the staff in the common priorities. Uh, we've been working on this budget process uh, since the fall in through the winter, and this uh, budget that you're about to see uh, uh, meets all of the board uh, parameters. It, we continue to support our multi-layer system of supports, and we are increasing in this budget the literacy intervention in CALIS and uh, our rice position at U32. It, we are also, you can see the checks there, we are also under the penalty threshold. Uh, and we, what you won't see here is that we also have a, a, a we have created a contingency plan for the general fund uh, reductions in case we needed it. So far, we do not need uh, that. Next slide. 
Jonas. Uh, so first, uh, we're gonna first thing we're gonna take a look at is enrollment uh, in the schools, and the reason this is important uh, is because Vermont's education funding formula is based on the cost per student or equalized pupil. So a decrease in enrollment uh, can negatively impact the tax rate before we make any changes to the budget. Uh, so on this slide, we're looking at the last five years of enrollment uh, in each of the schools. Um, the total district enrollment over the last five years uh, declined by 88 total students. Uh, in Berlin, uh, that decrease uh, was uh, was eight students from 217 five years ago uh, to 209. Uh, Callis has decreased uh, from 126 to 108. Dodie uh, down from 80 to 79 uh, over those five years. East Montpelier uh, from 229 uh, has increased uh, to 239 this year. Uh, Rumney uh, went from 176 down to 142, and U32. Uh, has decreased in enrollment from 766 five years ago uh, to 729. And so we'll look in the next slide at what that looks like by percentage. And you can see uh, all the way on the right there uh, that total district enrollment has gone down uh, over five and a half percent from fiscal 18 to fiscal 22. Uh, Berlin uh, down, you know, th about 3.7 percent. Callis down over 14 percent. Uh, Doty with just that one student, about one percent uh, down. Uh, East Montpelier is the outlier uh, with an increase in enrollment of about 4.4 percent over four years. Uh, Rumney down close to 20 percent, and U32 close to five percent. Uh, so again, all but one uh, school in the district uh, has seen enrollment decreases in the last five years, um, and. East Montpelier is the outlier. And again, this is important to understand uh, the, the funding formula and why uh, taxes could go up even if, you know, even if the, the district um, uh, approved a flat budget. Next slide. The, um, so on this slide, we're looking at the budget expanded services and what has gone up or down. Um, I believe they're all increases, but the additions equal 4.1 full-time equivalent increase of teachers and the full-time equivalents uh, equal a person 0.1. So four people plus a 0.1. And you can see the various categories there across the board. It also has the technology needs and the deferred replacement of building equipment down on the last two bullets. The other ones all in, um, indicate personnel changes. So the next one shows at U32 adding a social studies teacher of a 0. 0.6 FTE equaling the 39,546 and that will allow greater flexibility within their um, scheduling and more opportunities for students to achieve proficiency in the global citizenship standards, which is the what we now call social studies is global citizenship. Um, the current department FTE is 9.24 because of a one year temporary contract. Uh, next year, I have to scroll down on my screen down here. So hold on a minute. Um, we'll be 9.0 permanent positions. In East Montpelier, the music teacher is increasing by 0.2, which when you're looking at those FTEs, 0.2 equals a day. Uh, so that increases the 20,398. And this allows the music program to continue providing music, band, chorus, instrumental lessons to students weekly. And they are anticipating the increase of two more classrooms. And this FTE will support adding two more classrooms into the schedule on a weekly basis. On this slide, you can see additional position changes. 
And the leadership team established considerations such as the number of students, number of buildings, number of classes per week, half days between buildings to provide a robust um, programming for art and music. So you can see there's an FTE change um, from 0.3 FTE to 0.4 FTE for Callis's music. And it'll allow a full day in one building instead of traveling between buildings. And there's a similar increase in art, increasing from 0.3 FTE to 0.4 FTE at Callis and 0.5 FTE increasing to 0.6 at Berlin. Next slide. On this slide, you can see even more position changes. The addition of the two classroom teachers in East Montpelier um, is to allow classrooms to meet our school board's approved sizing. Right now, the classrooms do not. They have with 10 classrooms, six of the classrooms are at maximum or above what we recommend for our classroom sizes. And so with 11 classrooms, four out of the 11 classrooms would be the maximum or above. And so the extra two teachers would allow them to spread those students out and meet our board policies for classroom sizes. The special education um, increase of one FTE, um, they're working on a assessment across the district for special educators, um, should be completed in the near future. And it's going to help them ascertain both the needs of the students and the needs of the educators and where like the capacity of the educators within our district. And this is just gonna help us meet those needs. And we are gonna continue the equity scholar in residence. Um, we're using the um, fund balance to offset this because it's still a model that's changing how we use it and how it's helping us is changing and we haven't, we're working on it. So we're gonna keep it another year and it's coming out of the fund balance. So the slides shared by Anthony and Ursula um, illustrate more clearly the impact of new program and service requests on the budget, on our local education spending and the tax rate, as well as a proposed use of fund balance and grant funds. The leadership team is requesting $263,000 $526 in funding from the general fund for new programs and services, which has no offsetting revenue. While the leadership team is also requesting an additional $180,449, which we are recommending the use of the fund balance. Regarding the recommendation of use for fund balance for these two expenses, um, there was some rationale that was included in the previous slides. We know that historically, the board has been inclined to use fund balance for expenses that are clearly one year. We also want to balance the impact on our communities. And you will see shortly in that in our communities, the CLA um, is, has been changed a little bit. And so the tax rates in our five towns will be different due to that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The team is also proposing to utilize $59,397 of ARP ESSER funds. And ARP ESSER means American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. And so they want to use those funds to support additional time for a paraeducator at Doty and another 0.5 literacy interventionist at Callis. It's important to remember that ESSER funds are a temporary source of funds. $91,760 of Title IV funding would be used to offset the cost of a new educator for the high school RISE program at U32. And this program is similar to the current SPARC program in the middle school. The slide um, demonstrates the impact of Act 173 legislation on the delivery of special education services, illustrating the changes from the current funding model to the new funding model that will be effective on July 1st of this year. The mainstream block grant and reimbursement model for students 
under 60,000 have been replaced by one census block grant with funding based upon the district's ADMs averaged over the prior two years. The result is a decrease in funding of $498,820 or 13.6%. The reimbursement model for students over 60,000 remains. However, the formula has been altered to provide additional funding to the district. The total increase in extraordinary cost funding is $590,032 or 94.2%. We should note that some of this increase is a result of an increase in the number of students and the overall cost of the services provided for individual students. There's no change over last year in the method of funding state placed students or pre-kindergarten students who receive special education services. We're anticipating a reduction in state placed student expenses, which results in a decrease in revenue of 205,000 850 or 55.1%. Total reduction in special education revenues is $133,587 or 2.8%. So, uh, hi everybody. My name is Kari Bradley from Callis, and uh, my role is to share a summary of the proposed budget and show how the numbers come together to affect our tax rate. So a key point we wanna stress is that our district spending plan is, is really just one factor that will determine our tax rates. We're gonna talk about the other factors in a moment, um, but on this slide, we're gonna look at the education spending. Uh, it's the one factor that we can control. So expenditures are the amount that the district plans to spend and our plan includes additional monies for the new positions that we just discussed, um, updates to current staff salary and benefits, negotiate items, um, cybersecurity hardening, facility improvements, and many other things. Um, the revenues that we expect to receive uh, will, from the state and federal will partially offset these expenditures. Um, and the net of the expenditures, increased expenditures, increased revenues is an increase over last year of a little over a million dollars or 3.7%. So next slide, please. So the next factor um, that determines the tax rates is the number of pupils. And um, we saw before that there's been a, a general downward trend in the number of students. So equalized pupils is the two-year average of the daily average enrollment um, adjusted for several factors, including the number of students living in poverty or those with limited English proficiency. Our equalized pupil count decreased from 1,431 to last year to 1,413 this year. So this decree, decrease in the number of equalized pupils combined with the increase in the net education spending uh, results in an increase of um, spending of um, $977 per pupil, which is just about 5%. So next slide, please. So this slide talks about the common level of appraisal. This can be a challenging factor to explain, but it's very impactful and it explains the tax rate differences between our towns. So I'm gonna try to give a, a succinct uh, overview of this. So the CLA is a comparison of each town's total property value on their grand lists relative to what the state estimates is the current fair market value of those properties. So the greater the fair market value of the properties relative to the value that's on the town's books, the lower the CLA, all right? And as the CLA decreases, the tax rates go up. And just to, to spell it out, this year, a uh, decrease in the CLA of 0.6% uh, is equal to one cent on the tax rate. And one of the reasons this is so important is that we all know that property values have been increasing pretty rapidly lately, and that's happening more in some towns than in others. And since towns can't, they can't do reappraisals every year um, to update their grand list, the CLA is a way for the state to account for these differences and come up with an equalization each year. 
So this table compares the CLAs for each of our towns um, in, in the district year over year. And uh, we saw decreases in CLA uh, across the board, but it ranges between a 4.2% decrease and a 13.9%. And the most significant decreases are in Worcester and Berlin. And that means that those towns will have the higher tax rates. So, uh, you know, I know this is complex. And if you want more information, I, I invite you to reach out to myself or to Floor or Suzanne. Um, uh, we'd be happy to discuss it with you more. So next slide, please. So now this slide combines all of the factors that determine our tax rates. We've got the education spending, the pupil count, um, the CLA, and then the last factor is the property yield, which is the rate that the legislature will set later in this session in their session. Right now we're using an estimate estimate for the yield, and that was based on the tax commissioner's estimates from in from December. So one thing to note is that good news is that the state is holding a surplus from last year. And these numbers that you see here, are, they assume that none of that surplus is gonna be used to reduce tax rates. So likely um, it's believed that the legislature will allocate some of that amount um, to tax relief. So the final outcome should be more favorable than what you see here. Um, take, so taking all of this into account, um, the projected tax rates range from an increase of 8.4 cents in Berlin uh, to a seven cent decrease in East Montpelier. That's, that's quite a spread. Worcester will see a small increase and Middlesex and Callis would see modest decreases. Okay, next slide, please. And then this slide translates how do those tax projections actually um, affect property tax increases um, Berlin, as I said, would have the most significant increase in the scenario that we presented. Berlin homeowners would pay an additional $84 per $100,000 of home value. And on the other end of the spectrum in East Montpelier, taxpayers would see a decrease of $70 per $100,000. So in East Montpelier, a $300,000 home would result in, a, in a, actually a decrease in taxes of $210. Again, I want to stress this is that we're using the most conservative assumption about the yield, and we do expect better outcomes once the legislature finishes its work later this year. And also, it's important to point out that these, this analysis does not assume any savings or decreases from income sensitivity, and many homeowners actually see a reduction because they earn less than the state's threshold. So um, that's the summary of this part. I wanna thank the staff for all their good work and everyone's contributed to the budgeting process. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michaelin to talk about uh, the ballot. Hey there, wow. I am so glad that Kari dealt with that so that I didn't have to. <laughs> um, so I am here to say here is the sample ballot that you all should have received in the mail. Um, and don't forget to vote. Um, with the ballot, there was a description of how and when to um, vote, but you can mail it back in. And I believe the date for mailing it back in is next Monday. So try to get that in the mail or you can drop it off at the town clerk or um, vote in person on uh, town meeting day. Um, next slide, please. Um, you will see on the ballot that there is an article um, that includes a request from the town of Berlin that our school district convey 3.8 acres of land that's associated with the Berlin Elementary School to the town for the development of its new town center. Um, the land would be used for new town offices, recreation spaces, and a new ingress, ingress into the development adjacent to the Berlin Mall. They need to change the road um, to get to the backside of the mall. Um, so, as a school board, we have not taken a position on this request, um, but it's on the ballot for all of us voters to vote on. And I encourage you to learn more about it um, in, in the packet for tonight's meeting, which you can find on our website on page 37, I believe there's um, a bit of a more detailed description and a link to some more resources. Um, and if you really want some entertainment, you can pull up the ORCA recording of our meeting, I think was January 5th on that topic. <laughs> so don't forget to vote.
That's it. Thank you, everybody. So this is pretty much our last slide. And in here, we just want to remind you that you're going to be getting, uh, a, have to request a ballot separately for the Vermont uh, Central Vermont Career Center. Uh, the career technical location, uh, as you all know, is usually an afterthought. But uh, in the past two years, we've have been reminded of the importance of career and technical education. And as Act 77 reminds you, it, we, it encourages flexible pathways and the career center is a, is a great way or an other opportunity for, for our secondary students uh, to have a path to graduation and also to pursue higher education. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, Governor Scott declared February the uh, career and technical education month. So we need to invest more. This change in governance would allow us to have a say uh, in all the different districts. We have six districts that send students to the Central Vermont Career Center, 18 towns that are gonna be voting. So if you had any questions, please uh, visit in, in our uh, package today too, the frequently uh, asked questions are posted there. It, it, the articles of agreement and the whole report that we presented to the State Board of Education is posted in the Central Vermont Career Center. And there's also a great little video right in the middle of the website that shows the, exci the exciting things happening right now. We have had over 350 applications already for next year and we are beyond capacity. Um, so please uh, ask for your ballot uh, or get it uh, when you go to vote at your local town. Next slide, please. So here we are. Before we before we move into questions, I just wanted to take a, a minute to just pause and think about all the wonderful things that have happened this year for us to be able to be here and how the staff, the community, and uh, and um, everybody involved with the schools have come together. And it's been a really hard year, and I know that it's not over. But we just want to make sure that we appreciate the staff at Central Office all of the staff, our schools, uh, from bus drivers to, you know, everybody uh, contributes and makes a difference uh, for the life uh, of our kids. So with that, I would like to open it for questions for everybody. So please raise your hand if you have a question. I don't see any. Do you guys see any hints? Am I missing? Wow, you must have been really clear. <laughs> so the, no questions. Okay. Since we have one more minute, I'm going to take advantage of that one more minute before we move on. Uh, first, uh, to thank uh, Jen, our interim superintendent, and our leadership team for all the work in helping us be prepared. To, for, for this presentation and to, for all your collaboration really through and always keeping our kids at the center of everything you do. So we are really, uh, we have so much talent in this district and we're really, really lucky. And the next thank is to my fellow board members. I know that, you know, it's past January of celebrating board members, but thank you for all your work has been, we've been happy quite a lot of meetings. And we have three board members that are leaving our board. So I will wanna take a minute to just appreciate uh, Scott Thompson. Thank you for your work and for your education for the kids. And I wanna thank Jill also for your dedication and for your contributions in the past two years for us could, you know, we're gonna miss you all. Well, and Stephen Luke is not here with us today. I couldn't convince him <laughs> to, to come. He is a pretty private guy, but he's contributed many, 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 many years, as you know. So we owe him a great deal and we appreciate you all. So we're, we wish you the best. It, remember that I still have your phone number, so I might be calling. You. <laughs> so thank you. So if we don't have any questions, maybe we should jump in early into our 
meeting unless board members have or unless everybody needs a five minute break we could wait for a break in at the hour what do you think keep going keep going really okay let's keep growing i'll make sure i have the right agenda not recording agenda. stopped meaning so this uh, we already called the meeting to order reception recording of in progress thank you everybody for being here and let's start with student reports Hi everyone. I'm not sure if my Wi-Fi is gonna hold up. I really hope it does, but I do live in Berlin now, so it's a little touchy. Um, starting off tonight, uh, very recently, I am a senior representative on the senior committee, and we have um, finally figured out that we're going on a senior trip this year, which will be right before graduation. We are going to Lake George, and we're staying in the Fort Henry Hotel, I believe, for a night, and then the next day we're going whitewater raft. So we've been able to get about 40 um, out of the like 130 students to go. So that's very, very exciting for me. And on the same note, prom will also happen this year, uh, like a real prom <laughs> um, in May. And there's already a committee working on it. And we're really hoping that it'll be amazing for all the seniors who have missed a lot in the past few years. So with that, so sports are happening, of course, winter sports are going on. After this, I am actually going to the boys basketball game. And uh, the past week, there have been a bunch of hockey games, basketball, the Nordic. And because we've been able to have um, people coming to watch, the student section has really grown and we've been able to have really, really strong school spirit this year. So it's very, very nice for all of our athletes to have all the support from them. Uh, and then this Monday was Valentine's Day, and every year we try to do a flower sale, um, which we continued this year, as well as a table run by the conversation group, which we have a conversation group in Montpelier and here, and I think I have mentioned it before, um, which had a bunch of resources about consent and some stickers and candy as well, um, so that was really fun. If you look at the newsletter and check that out um, online, I believe Jess Wills, our um, assistant principal, does send that out every so often. There is recognition of um, our CBL programs, our branching out, and our pilot programs. And very recently, we've had two of our students who are juniors in that group who are studying music. They have actually released a new song um, on Spotify that, as of tonight, has 50 views, which is pretty cool um, with that. And um, within a, I believe it was a CBL program, two students were able to study uh, Japanese cuisine and actually work with an actual chef. And as well as that, someone has been working with owls. And it's a really, really good way for students, especially during COVID, to learn and experience things that they are really passionate about. Um, and also starting this week, uh, a lot of students started coming up with their schedule for next year. And I know that a lot of people are planning on early college or dual enrollment. We're juniors now. Um, so that's really cool. And yeah. Um, another semi fun happening, also stressful happening for juniors and seniors in our English or any AP level English classes. Uh, currently, I'm in World Authors and I am starting to do an author study, which we do for, I believe it's a couple months, and we choose. Um, a, a global, national, international author. Um, I chose Mashan Hamid, who is a Pakistani author, and we read two main major pieces of them, and then we read smaller pieces of them, and we've create, we're creating multi-genre projects. So this gives students an, um, an ability to show to get a research standard for graduation, as well as have some fun with the project so it's not all, you know, a 20-page essay. Um, for, I believe, Advanced Expo, which I took last year, uh, students are starting to do the iSearch, which is the less fun of the research projects, and you choose a conflict. I, last year, I chose the impact of electronics on a functioning society, and you read a bunch of sources, you grab a couple books, you do a bunch of online sources, and you end up creating a, a big TED Talk at the end of the project. So students are all starting to do their big projects for the end of the year right now. Uh, and finally, uh, we do have February break coming up next week, which is a week and a half. And all the students I know are really looking forward to it. 
and I'm sure the staff is as well. So, yeah. Well, thank you both. And I wanna take this opportunity to also thank Anna for her service as a school board member and for being willing to join us. I know you're gonna be moving on and we wish you the best in your next journey. I failed to call it for public comments. So I'm gonna ask, unless board members have questions from our students. No. Are there any public comments? I just jumped since we didn't have questions after the other one, I just assume, but any hands? I'm just giving an opportunity for people to raise hands. I don't see any hands. Am I missing something? No. Okay, good. Any agenda revisions? I was so excited to hear about the students that I... No? Okay. So we had student reports. So let's move right to you, Jen and Maria. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everybody. So um, Maria and I are going to do our best to explain to you somewhat succinctly what's going on um, in terms of the COVID context, and we'll welcome any questions that you have as well. So you know that each week um, I report the case count with Maria's help in the community letter. I'll give you the official numbers tomorrow. When I took a quick cursory uh, view, we have, have a, we've had about 15 cases or so since last week across all of our schools. I think the a big piece of news, as you know, is that the um, state mask guidance is changing. And so um, the current requirement for universal masking indoors will expire at the end of this month. And, um, and after that, schools that have achieved um, an 80% vaccination rate of their eligible population um, do not need to require masks. Right now, U32 is the only one of our schools who's achieved that rate. They're just under 85%. Um, and we have a few elementary schools, Callis and East Montpelier, that are approaching the 80% mark, but they're not quite there. The state is going to release the numbers. So um, we've been calculating, Maria has been working hard to, to keep up with that vaccination rate number as the data in the immunization registry are updated. And the state has announced that they are gonna be an, um, uh, providing the official numbers we are looking at uh, moving from sort of this whole pandemic transition to endemic gradually and thoughtfully. And I think that that's important. Um, we know that historically, after times of a break away from school, we've come back and experienced higher case counts for a period. We know that over February break, um, some folks will be traveling, some folks will be socializing in ways that are different than they socialize when school is in session. And so we will we'll make sure that we're universally masked for the week that we get back so that we can just sort of have a little bit of buffer and then take it from there. Um, I think a few other things that I will mention, and then I'm going to ask Maria to fill in everything that I missed. Um, another thing that's happening is that the state, um, you know, uh, at the, by the end of January, they eliminated um, PCR surveillance testing. In its place, they've now started staff assurance testing, which means that every staff member um, has access to uh, one testing kit, which provides two uh, rapid antigen tests per week. And so those, um, we have them in the district and we've been distributing them. And we also, the state is offering post-break testing. If you recall, during the December break, um, the state announced these big distribution sites. And that was, um, <laughs> an exercise in how to how to operate more smoothly the next time around and so this time they're going through the schools and um and so we're getting those shipments and any family that has um signed the consent form or spoken to the school nurse in the case of the um the elementary schools will have access to take home a kit so that they can take tests on february 28th and march 1st in anticipation of the return to school on the second we're gonna be looking at the gradual uh, sort of lessening of other mitigation strategies, uh, bearing in mind that the new weather will be getting warmer and we might try to um, enact more uh, pre-pandemic practices 
for example, uh, lunch at the elementaries can be uh, less restrictive. It's important to note that um, it has been less restrictive at U32 all along, and we have seen no evidence of transmission of COVID-19 through the cafeteria at U32. So that should um, be something that assuages folks' uh, concerns. It's also important to know that um, based on our current understanding of the guidance, because pre-kindergarten students are not yet eligible for the vaccine, um, they will still be masked, even if the rest of their elementary school achieves that 80 percent um, rate. And we know that these changes are going to be welcomed by some people and they're going to be viewed with um, some deep anxiety and fear by others. Um, when we get to a place in any one of our schools where masking is optional, we're going to just uh, embrace the mission statement, those verbs nurturing and inspiring, and hope that we approach that with kindness and caring and respect for choices that people are making. Um, Maria, will you fill in what I'm missing and or ask for questions and answer them more technically than I possibly could? <laughs> Um, I think that was extremely thorough. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we can take it from there. Uh, okay. Hi, Maria. Um, <clears throat> do we know, it, it, I hope you'll indulge me with a couple of uh, what I hope are going to be quick questions. Do we know if there has been any transmission, any cases that began in the schools, transmission in the school? Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of different kinds of transmission, right? If, if let me give you an example. The, the one case that we thought that we had secondary transmission so um, there's primary transmission. That means that a child who was infected in the community comes into the school and infects somebody in the school, right? That's a primary transmission. Um, if that child who then uh, was infected infects another child that becomes secondary transmission, we go all the way through to tertiary and then we, we worry about that our mitigation strategies aren't working. Um, we have had one case that we're aware of at Berlin um, where a student was at a funeral that was a super spreader event. The child came to school and we recognized within four days that there were um, three other cases in that classroom that came from that student. That was our first case of primary moving to secondary transmission and we closed that classroom down immediately. So that is one of the okay. few cases that we're aware of where we did have spread within a classroom. Um, the rest of the cases that I'm aware of have been purely primary transmission, um, meaning somebody came in from the community that was positive and gave it to one or more of the people in that class or in school. Um, we have had no, what in doing test to stay in doing test at home um, and in surveillance testing, we have not seen more than what we think is one or potentially two cases um, of in-school transmission. I don't know if that answers exactly your question. That answers exactly my time. question. Perfect. <laughs> Extremely detailed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maria, would you say that masks and masking have been an important component of preventing further spread um, and infections in the school buildings? In my professional opinion, I think masks are an important part of our mitigation strategy when okay. worn appropriately. Um, and one, one more question, um, and I, this is also for Jen, um, are... If one elementary school, you know, if one school, you know, if one school begins to have ma optional masks and another school does not yet, um, are we concerned about an equity issue between schools? Are there in are there inequitable factors that may make one school optional mask and another not? 
I'm going to do my best to answer that question. Right now, the guidance is talking about when somebody, when a school achieves 80% vaccination rate of their eligible student population. Um, and in terms of, um, I mean, I think that some of your question is why we want to wait and see what is happening in terms of next steps and to continue to communicate with our communities and our staff members too. Um, I think that's the best I can do right now, Jonas, with that question. I mean, we're, we've been working with, as, as you all know, um, we've signed a memorandum of agreement this year with our association related to COVID. And it says right in there, we'll be talking about masking. We've initiated those conversations right now too, so that we know that as we're moving Moving forward, uh, guided by the science, which is something that we've been doing all along, we can make those decisions that are going to continue to keep our community safe. Um, there's been a lot in the news around mental health as well, which is another factor overall to be considering. So that's the best that I can say right now. Marie and I will continue to meet and talk with folks and get smarter and smarter as we, you know, as we've needed to do all along. Maria, what would you add to that response? Nothing, except I love it when you say that. It sounds so funny to me when Jen says, I got to get smarter. That's how I hear it in my own head because it's so <laughs> unlike Jen. It really amuses me. Well, um, yeah, <laughs> that's all. So I th thank, thank you guys for those answers. I really appreciate it. I want to say I, I did not have Nathan show up here as a prop. That was not timed. Um, but for it's been heartbreaking to see the vaccines for the kids under five pushed farther and farther back. I really appreciate that we are keeping our mask mandate until after the break. Um, I would really, really encourage us to think about continuing that until a couple of weeks after the little kids can get vaccinated. They are going to be in the building. They don't wear masks all that well. They are not well fitting. Little four-year-olds are not wearing N95s right in the school buildings. There are lots of families out there with little kids. I would really encourage us to think about keeping the mask mandate, making not making it optional until enough of the little kids have had a chance to get vaccinated. I know my kid is going to get it. I want him to be vaccinated before he gets it. The one thing I just want to add to that is I, I we did talk to the admin team. And from what I know from working in several of the schools um, is that pre-K is generally pretty separate from the rest of the population of an elementary school for several reasons, right? But they tend to have a separate playground. They tend to have a separate classroom. They eat separately. There's very little mixing of pre-K and K and above, um, which I think is the only saving grace for the potential of optional masking in a school um, that has, an, has a population that's ineligible for the vaccine. And I, I definitely would encourage if we do start moving in that direction, those principles to um, further that divide and make sure that we can keep that vulnerable population, that vulnerable population as safe as possible. Thank you, Maria. Hey, Chris, you have a question? I do. Uh, Maria, um, this question is uh, first for you. Um, did you say that you think that masking is an important part of um, our mitigation strategy? I did. Um, and does that um, belief end on February 28th because the guidance from the AOE is changing? It does not. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you that um, I also believe although I haven't been asked that directly, that an exit strategy is absolutely necessary. And that one of the things that I have been, um, I've had the luxury of as a person who spends eight hours a day doing nothing but researching COVID um, mm -hmm. is that um, many people who don't have that luxury of watching the science evolve spend a lot of time mired in the guidance we had in 2020 and even 2021 and even the start of this school year. Things have changed really, really quickly and have continued to change quickly with COVID. Um, and I think that, uh, that U32 is in a really prime position 
to make this move to remove masks. Um, I'm an opinionated person. Anyone who works with me will tell you that I'm very free with my um, opinions. And if I thought that this was an extremely unsafe move, um, you would hear it loud and clear. Um, I'm gonna take another step uh, without making any accusations at all and tell you that elementary student, elementary school students, we think that they're not as good at wearing their masks, but they are way better at wearing their masks than any teenager. Um, U32 spends a great deal of time trying to keep kids to keep their masks on appropriately. And they don't because they're, I'm so sorry, this is Coco. Um, because uh, they're teenagers and their job um, primarily is to um, be teenagers. So I would say that U32 has shown us that even without wearing masks with fidelity, which teenagers do not do, we have not had transmission in that school. We discussed at the admin meeting that U32's biggest struggle this year has been lunch. Um, there are anywhere between 100 to several hundred, Stephen knows the numbers better than I do, in the cafeteria um, every single day, even spreading out to three or four, I can't remember, lunch fans. Um, and we've not had any transmission within that. Um, and that's, that's supposed to be six kids to a table. It's routinely 10 kids to a table, 12 kids to a table. Uh, again, teenagers. Um, and they have, we have not had transmission. So I think that we are learning that a lot of our, our mitigation strategies work best when they're piled on top of each other. But taking off masks, I think is the correct first step at this point. Um, one of the things that people are still panicked about, I got an email today that said, you've not managed to keep transmission at zero wearing masks. How can you keep transmission at zero not wearing masks? And without sounding disrespectful or uncaring, our goal is not to keep transmission at zero. Our, it's unrealistic and impossible. Um, our goal is to keep people as safe as possible as we negotiate this pandemic. So as this pandemic starts to move closer and closer to the endemic, um, we have to take some steps to see what we can do to get back to pre-pandemic practices. Um, I'm not saying that in a month we won't get another variant and we won't pop those masks right back on. But I, I do believe that while masks have been extremely important for us at this point, um, U32 is at a stage where I think it's appropriate to start to loosen those restrictions. So let me ask you a follow up on that. Is sure. um, you, you talked about having a, um, an ex essentially an exit strategy from the mm -hmm. pandemic into post pandemic times. Um, if we're going to go through and, and have a no mask, uh, get rid of the mask mandate, um, should there be incorporated in that um, process uh, a trigger point where masks are then required again, rather than, you know, so that, so that we have a goal and say, okay, if we see a level like this, masks are back on until we go under the level again? Um, or is it just going to be just kind of, rolling with what occurs as it occurs. Um, one of the things I found the most interesting about this job is people have continually asked me, can you give me um, a flow chart of exactly what happens when someone tests positive? Can you tell me what, at what level we can take masks off in sports? Can you tell me why you wouldn't take masks off on the ninth? It, it, there's been very little black and white with this pandemic and I, I hesitate to say that there is a black and white answer um, to that. I think um, one, we're gonna follow, continue to follow state and federal guidance, which is to, at this point to start, um, we're making assumptions based on last spring and the fact that our numbers have plummeted uh, since last yeah. month. Um, and uh, I am a safer rather than sorry person. If I felt like numbers were rising precipitously or another variant comes into play, um, I think that we would start that conversation earlier rather than later. Um, I think masking is here to stay to some extent um, to the point where we're discussing next year, if, if kids are coming back with mild symptoms from any illness, we're discussing perhaps they can't come back unless they're masked. 
um, right? Because we know that masks help with not spreading germs. We're, we're toying with how masks are going to fit into our future in general, um, but we don't have a set point um, in terms of when we would automatically put masks back on. Um, part of that is because we have no idea what's coming down the pike. We, so far, we've never had any idea what's happening next um, with COVID. And the next step is, um, I'm sorry, my child just made this crazy face at me and I don't know what she wants. Um, can you wait, please? Thanks. Um, and I totally spaced the, where I was going from there. So, okay. sorry. So, um, explain for us, please, what the yeah. masking uh, policy will be for the elementary schools. Since there sure. seems to be a clear divide between U32 and the elementary schools. Um, there is a clear divide. Um, U32 is at 84.75% uh, vaccination okay. rate. Um, and the elementary schools um, are not at this point. So in moving forward, U32, we're looking at having them um, go mask optional on the 9th of March, which would give us a seven day buffer to balance the, um, the knowledge that we tend to have a spike after um, any kind of a break. And the elementary schools at this point are gonna continue as is. They're gonna start loosening some of the tighter restrictions as in not talking during lunch, as in um, having lunch in classrooms. We're gonna start letting them come back together in the cafeteria, again, moving slowly towards pre-pandemic practices. Um, and we're just gonna monitor the data that comes from all of these small changes so that we can, when the time comes to lift the restrictions altogether, we feel confident um, that we have sort of walked our community through this in a way that can help people feel comfortable with these changes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your answers. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I don't see any other hands up. So I just want to thank you for continuing to be our North Star in this. It's really hard. And thank you for continuing to guide us. We support both of you. And thank you for uh, all you do and for sending that letter today. Uh, let's continue to move on. Uh, I'm uh, going to assume that Chris's hand is an all hand. So um, for operations. Let's move into board self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, Carrie, I'm going to let you guide us through this. Sure. So thanks. Um, so thank you, everybody, for taking our survey. Since this is the final meeting of our board year, I um, want to take this chance to reflect on how the year went and see what we might learn from it, what, what we might want to focus on in the coming year. So the thought here was to do a go around and get your response to the questions that are in the packet. What, what's your reaction to these results? And are there one or two topics that you'd like to carry forward in next year's work? So um, Floor, do you, how do you want to do it? Do you want me to call on people or you, would you prefer to do it? Uh, no, go ahead. You can, you can call on people. Okay. So does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Jonathan, okay, and then I'll just go in the order I see. So after Jonathan, Chris, and then Jonas. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I just wanted to add just quickly that I hope that uh, I know the federal government has largely picked up the, the expense for uh, free meals for all kids during the pandemic. And I hope that we can, in our budgeting going forward, continue that if the federal government stops funding uh, lunches and meals for children post-pandemic. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Chris, Jonas, and then McKaylin. Chris, are you on mute? I'm sorry. Thank you, Kyrie. You um, Great. So I will admit to not um, respond to the survey. Um, just due to oversight. Um, but in looking at the responses, what um, struck me is um, it seemed like a, a um, desire for more board discussion before decision-making. 
which seemed to be a very um, good thing for us to uh, have more of. And um, yeah, I think that I think we've had good discussions over the past couple of meetings, and I think it would do well for us as a board to continue um, in that line. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. So Jones and then Kalen and Maggie. Yeah. So the things that that uh, the things that stand out to me are the low ones. Um, our policies identify measurable outcomes or objectives. Um, the board adopts and monitors policies uh, related to budgeting and financial oversight. And um, I guess not so much this one. The the code of ethics. Um, it seems. I, I, I think one of the things we need to work on is, is measuring things, measuring outcomes, setting goals and holding ourselves and others accountable for meeting those goals. Um, I think that's really, really hard. Um, but I, I, when I filled this out, you know, that, that first one, our policies identify measurable outcomes or objectives where appropriate, um, definitely something we need to work on. Great. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, McKaylin and Maggie and Floor. <clears throat> what do I want to say? I guess as a as a um, brand new member who you know filled a vacancy halfway through the year, um, I'm just personally excited to um, you know learn more about um, you know everything that goes into this. And you know I found some of these questions I I wasn't sure the answers to frankly because I was I'd just been thrown in. So I'm excited to do some more training and. Um, just learn more on the job. Great, right, thank you. So Maggie, then Floor and Diane. Uh, I'm gonna echo what McKaylin said and, and had a like experience answering the survey questions. Um, although I'd say in general, um, my responses were really affirmative. I think that the board has a really high level of integrity and I'm also, and you know, coming in halfway through, filling somebody um, some big shoes, someone who'd been involved for a very long time, and Dorothy, and um, yeah, it, looking forward to being able to better respond to those questions next year with greater experience. And as an aside, I would just say I appreciate the um, additional educational opportunities that come through the school board association. Um, those email updates and the materials that we received as new board members certainly makes this less daunting um, on that level. And, you know, I'm, I would really like to see us improve our community engagement. And I think the low turnout for tonight's um, public forum is, is exemplifies the fact that we really need to work on this. Um, and I happened to have a young man visiting my house this weekend who was writing his thesis, his master's thesis on Front Forum. And um, one of the big conversations that he and I had in this visit was that while it um, can be a very useful tool, it really um, can be self-limiting. And I'm hopeful that we can do a good job of reaching um, everybody in our community in terms of helping them have access to participation. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, Floor and then Diane and Ursula. Thanks, Gary. So uh, when I saw the results, I, I, I saw that we are all over the place in, 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 most, in, in most of them. So uh, what came to mind, and you won't be surprised, is you know, more training, summer retreats. Just we, we haven't been able to really be in person, especially with this new board. The other day I was in town and I saw McKellen for the first time in person, right? Like it's just like, so I think we need some some time to continue to align our goals. I, I think that we have been operating pretty good as a board, but I feel like we need to get smarter about policies to make, like we, we really need to get smarter both in, in, in our budget. We had that conversation on our finance committee. So, so we should, that is the way that we can drive um, in, and monitor uh, our, our outcomes too. So, so that's, all, that's all I have to say. I just need to get smarter at policies. And, and I think we just do it like we're doing with the quality committee, like we're reviewing it. Maybe we can think about doing that with our policies too, because I think the more we learn our roles and responsibilities and how we can affect change is that the better that we are. That's, that's it. 
Okay, get, get smarter. All right, Diane, you're next, and then Ursula and Maya, if you want to go. Uh, yeah, what I was struck by was that, um, well, my takeaway from it was that, again, it's around, to me, it's around that orientation and how do we, there are those of us who are kind of farther out in the water because we've been here over a year. And then when we have new people come on board, we haven't quite figured out how to get on the same page to be at least aware of where we're at and why certain things might be the way they are so that when the dialogue happens, then we can expand, change or grow however um, it needs to as a board. So I think we're still figuring out what is that orientation and um, bringing on board members so that they feel that they're having an authentic um, engagement and involvement with the conversations and, um, and not that they're trying to play catch up because we might not be explaining things very well if we've been on longer. So working on that part. Great, thank you, Diane. So Ursula will go and then Maya and Lindy. Thank you, Kari. So one of the first things I noticed when I was looking at the ratings was the fact that the policy questions are the ones that, that had the lower ratings. And I, it struck me as interesting. I didn't necessarily know being new, I don't know where that comes from necessarily. And like that first one um, where it talked about outcomes or objectives that are measurable, it left me with a question on whether or not that was something we can do with policies, whether our policies really have like a measurable um, outcome or a measurable effect. Um, and so I'm interested in learning more on that. And I also noticed in the general, where we could just put in the general comments, um, there was definitely a common theme of more discussion time, especially on bigger issues and more training and, and being able to learn more. And I identify with that being new. I definitely want to learn more. And I'd like to see, I don't know, I want to learn more about policies and policy generation, I guess. Thanks, Ursula. Uh, Maya, you still here? Looks like she might have dropped off. Um, Lindy, then Scott and Jill. Well, I'm coming from a different perspective when I hear the scores are all over the place because they're all in the above the 2.5 and into the threes and only eight people responded, I believe it said. So um, I think I thought they looked pretty good. I one of the things about the public reaction or public um, participation is there what in my years of being on the board, whether it was at the East Montpelier, when we had carousels at U32, we have not had a lot of public participation at board meetings. So I'm, I'm not sure that that's new or different. And I like to think of it as the uh, community trusts what's going on. We get a lot of participation when um, we cut a position, especially an arts position. <laughs> uh, at East Montpelier. I remember years ago when Spanish used to be taught there and then it wasn't, we had a lot of participation. So the public participation is usually over an issue that people feel deeply about personally. And uh, Act 46 obviously was um, like that, but those meetings were separate from board meetings. We had them at board meetings, but they also had the Act 46 meetings for the consolidation. So I'm not sure as far as how to get the public involved or if things are running really well, we don't hear from public in a lot of the areas of um, public jobs and public service. Uh, the policy parts, I've been on the policy committee and I think of them as more about rules and how things work versus the outcomes. So that one was interesting to me as far as policies on student, I don't know if it's really student outcomes or what those outcomes, that question was a little odd, but uh, those were my observations. Great, thanks. Uh, so Scott and then Jill, I guess, our departing members, can you get to tell us what, what we should focus on next year? That would be even more hubristic than I'm capable of, Kai. But no, thank you. Um, Maggie, Maggie spoke uh, of filling very big shoes of Dorothy's, 
And poor Daniel, I'm just leaving him a pair of worn out <laughs> shoes with holes in them. But um, I, I think, you know, this past year was really tough. Um, a rocky road, if there ever was one. But my own sense of it is in the, in the long arc of my uh, school board history, this board actually does pretty well with the mechanical parts, with the machinery of, of um, what we're supposed to do. What I, what I would love to see, and especially as I graduate into becoming a member of the community, is um, I think it would be great for the board uh, to be interesting and ambitious and um, inspiring for people, that there's nothing wrong with that, um, especially if it can somehow be coordinated with with others in within the school community, especially with staff, so that um, you know we don't risk running out ahead of of where people are um, prepared to go. But I think um, you know to hark back to something that Deborah Taylor said two years ago. So much potential, and um, and I mean. It's, it's really very, very good as it is. I, I'd love to see, you know, even more. Um, and I know that we're capable of it. So I look forward to the rest of you um, doing more than I could in this. And I'll be rooting for you all the way. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Jill, and then Jen, if you want to go, we'll invite your comment. Thanks. Um, I, you know, first, I actually want to just um, uh, say that I, I do feel a little bad that I was not one of you who could be a long serving board member. And um, I, you know, I, as many of you know, I went out on, on medical leave for a while in the fall. And I just discovered that I could not get all my plates spinning again. Um, when I came back, I had so many spinning when I went out and I could not figure out how I was doing it. And so just really felt like I had to make a little more space in my life. And so I wanted to share with all of you that that's really kind of the process that I went through. Um, in terms of this board, I, you know, I wanna say that I, I, I actually am amazed at the extent to which this board has been able to come together as a group to work functionally together, considering the newness of the board as a district considering that we quickly went into a pandemic, considering the transition of superintendent, there's really, we've been through quite a lot in my short tenure. And um, I think this group is actually really well positioned to move into what I hope will be, um, you know, a time when you can return your attention more to the things that I think we all, you know, run for school board to do, like, focusing on student outcomes and what's happening with schools in our community. Um, I think you're, I think this group is really well positioned to do that. And I, I feel really hopeful for the future. And I, I am uh, grateful to have been able to serve with all of you, even if just for a short time. Thanks, Jill, very nice. Uh, Jen, do you wanna go? Um, sure. I will say, um, I think from my experience serving you in this way this year so far, I would echo some of what Joe just said in terms of um, how much we have been through and how much um, your support of this school system and uh, me in the interim role and of each other has meant and has served the school community overall. I don't doubt that for, for one minute. I think that when we're fully functioning as a system, um, it helps us all do our best work and service to the kids, which is exactly why we're here. And I look forward to the day as I look through this data um, that we can continue to put at the board level, the systems and the structures, the routines, the predictability that are gonna help us flourish so that there are things that are you know, routine practice so we're well poised to then deal with the unexpected or the things that are challenging. It's what we seek to do in our work here as administrators. And, um, and, and when we can do that, then everything else comes into place. I think about even back in my um, 
in my teaching days or in my principal days, when um, something unexpected and hard happens, we lean into the routines and practices that we know already work. I remember being an elementary principal and thinking about morning meetings being the place that uh, that's where we could come and have those conversations. I think the same thing here. So when we have a system for policies, when we get in that practice of budgeting year round on a regular basis, reviewing our student learning outcomes, all of those things that I just feel like we are right on the brink, um, then I, I think we're gonna do even better work together. I look forward to it. Thanks, Jen. Um, did I miss any board members? Did we get them all? Anybody missing? Um, so I'll go. I, I actually um, sort of agreed with Lindy. I thought the scores were quite good. Um, uh, and um, I was really um, encouraged by some of the comments that um, just the reasons that people do the work and, and the value they see in it. I thought it was kind of touching and encouraging. So thank you. Um, uh, one of the things I took from it thinking about next year was that uh, a couple of pe people mentioned training and um, and mentorship. So so development. And I know it's really hard to imagine, like, where would we find the time? But maybe if we're not doing a, a public forum every month next year, maybe we could think about scheduling more trainings, whether it's in how we use our policies, measurable policies or community outreach. Um, we, there's a lot to learn and we could spend some time doing it. So thanks everybody, I, uh, hopefully this was valuable and um, uh, we will work on how we might use this in the retreat or in next year in general. So floor back to you. Thank you, Kari, and thank you for doing this. I thought, I thought this was really valuable for all. Okay, let's move uh, 5.2 2022 officers. The steering committee wanted to bring this up uh, today to just to just make sure if there was any transition or what people were people were thinking. So our officers are, as you know, the, the chair, the vice chair and the clerk. So I open it to conversation. Uh, what, what we wanna do, I, I am still hoping <laughs> to continue to be your chair and serve you as a chair, but it, we thought it would be just proper to you know, bring it up for conversation, uh, Chris? You know, I, I think since we're gonna have new board members, uh, this is yeah. better left to then uh, to, to discuss when we have all the board the new members, just for the sense of um, that they will have a fair share in the vote uh, rather than then have the sense that it's predetermined and their vote doesn't matter. So I think we should table this discussion until, I mean, just just for the new board members. Um, and it just seems like that's when it should happen. When we reorganize and have, because um, we have a couple of new members. Uh, so just a yeah. thought. Yeah, totally. It, Carrie, I probably didn't do a good job explaining it anyway. So do you want to just yeah. share some of our talk because you brought it up, our steering committee. Sure, and, sure. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think Chris's approach is is a fine one, and often boards will will do that. The reality is that we show up on March, what is it, second, third, and the okay. very first thing we do is elect officers, and the new people they 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 have nothing to base it on, and basically you, you start nominations and you start voting. In my experience on other boards, it, it, we're not deciding anything tonight. We're just letting each other know what we're thinking, if anything, if there's any questions people have, like what does it mean to be the secretary? This is a chance to, to, to learn about it. And, and um, I, to, in, in my mind, it's just healthy to have a little conversation. And you know, if people don't want to, that's fine too. And, and uh, as far as it goes, I'm happy to continue serving as vice chair. I have no plans uh, to, to be the chair and I, would, I wouldn't do that role. Um, uh, so if, if, if we want the vice chair to be, you know, sort of a stepping stone um, to, the, to the chair, uh, we might consider somebody else, but I'm happy either. Thank you, Carrie. Any other comments? Uh, Jonas, you had, yeah, Chris, do you have? I was gonna. If so, I was gonna. I, I think a discussion is fine, but my concern was 
new board members feeling excluded and thinking that it's um, a yeah. already a done deal, um, which in practical terms it may be, but you know it's just kind of the the perception as well uh, that we're starting off in a clean slate. And Carrie's right; new board members come in, they go, "I, I don't know the who, I don't know who I'm going to vote." They would have no basis really for for voting, but it's it's still, you know, just that was my concern of of, of them feeling excluded, uh, and you know, Carrie almost sounded like. Putin for a minute there in his Ukrainian U Ukrainian uh, atmosphere uh, or his <laughs> Ukrainian comments. It's Carrie said with all good humor because I enjoy you so much. Okay, well, if, should we move on then to oh, wait, slide one? Three? Chris, 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 did you just compare Kari Bradley to Vladimir Putin? Oh my God. Oh. Yeah. oh. Only in terms I, I of saying, like, I have no intents of doing anything, blah, blah, blah. Chris, I sentence kidding. you to be I, clerk. I sentence you to be clerk. That's terrible. Send me to the gulag instead. Uh, yeah, I, I think we should. I was I was trying to get that <laughs> under uh, Jonas. So, okay, Chris, put your hand down and mute yourself, please. And let's move on because <laughs> this is not so. In, in any of it, let's move forward. We look forward to March 2nd, and of course, all of the members would be in, included and we'll have a meaningful conversation. Uh, school board vac vacancies on 5.3. It just wanted to let everybody know that, uh, as, as you know, it was just not official, but Scott, uh, Stephen Luke has uh, officially stepped down uh, at the end of, you know, basically the beginning of February. As you can see, and he wanted us to be the one selecting the superintendent. He's been a long serving member and he's not going to be with us. So we have an opening in East Montpelier for a year. So we would be having to appoint, unless there is a writing candidate that I, I don't, we don't know about yet. And then we, the same for, for, for Middlesex, we didn't have somebody in the ballot. So there is an open position with Jill Living. So uh, also keep uh, keep in mind that and ask your friends. And other than that, those are the only two open uh, positions so right now. And then we would have members, we, the new members that are running, right? So we are gonna bring, we're gonna finally have three members from Worcester. And uh, uh, you have a hand up again, Chris. I do, I, I'm just in Middlesex. Dennis Hill is staging a writing campaign. Um, and okay. he had previously applied to be a, a, a representative for Middlesex. So um, he's the only writing I'm aware of. So please pass the word along. Okay. That he is, he is um, actively campaigning on Front Porch Forum. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So let's move on, unless there's any questions on that. We, and we, we are gonna have a new member from Callas, obviously running, um, but every, so it's just, we wanna talk about the vacancies, which is the two positions that we don't know who's there so that we can all actively, if you talk to somebody or hear of somebody, uh, please let them know. Uh, Central Vermont Career Center, there was a, a, a small update on page 30 of your packet. And I'm wondering if there's any questions. We had an informational meeting last night that is recorded and on the website too. And we talked a little bit on the presentation. So I'm not, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on that unless there's questions. Okay, so thank you for voting. on. That. Sorry, sorry, Floor. One, one yes. question about voting for the Career Center. Um, if yeah. one has already received and submitted their their mail their mail in ballot, their absentee ballot, can one go to their local polling place on town meeting day and just request a ballot for the Career Center? Yes, yes, yes. You, you can. Yeah, you can. In all. 18 towns, you can do the same, and Cabot did mail all the ballots to, to everybody because they're so small. And Okay, uh, upcoming community forums. 
So we wanted to talk a little bit about the, and Kari just mentioned a little bit about changing too, but it, Jen, I'm gonna let you speak a little bit to the community forums. So the Ed Quality Committee had not met for a while and we were talking about the um, at least two of the student learning outcomes that we need to um, finish up to, to go through and achieve that goal. One is artistic expression, the other is global citizenship. And um, we were wondering if those would be um, appropriate topics for a, a community forum, things that are of interest and student-centered. Um, and the Ed Quality Committee is currently scheduled to meet on March 2nd. We'll review artistic expression and, um, and that's your reorganization meeting anyway. So it doesn't see, and you will have just had the annual meeting on February 28th, two days prior. So it, it didn't necessarily make sense to do artistic expression then on March 2nd as a community forum. I know that um, there's been some conversation with some of you and Floor has taken the lead on um, some sort of forum. I've been out of the loop on it, but around the prevention stuff that, um, and Floor, I don't know if you can speak more to yeah. that, the woman that you've been talking to a little bit, yeah. Yeah, um, so we, uh, she is gonna be completely separate uh, from, uh, from, from us. She's gonna come to our next board meeting on, uh, actually on the 16th is when I had invited her to come and talk more about it. And it's combined with the five towns, it's gonna still be um, remote. If, uh, a, re a remote meeting, but she had been trying to coordinate which each, uh, which just doing one at East Montpelier, one at Calais, and coordinating directly with the town, uh, the, the town administrators. And uh, she reached out to us, and actually Stephen was the one. Stephen Luke was the one that said, you know, maybe we should have a coordinated effort. So she, uh, Olivia, is going to come to our next meeting. And, and let us and, and explain more about the prevent. It's, it's just a prevention in drug and alcohol uh, use. And I don't have all the documents. She's going to give us the documents uh, the Friday prior so that they go into our our package. But we won't be leading it. We can we can participate, but it's something that helps uh, also our communities at large. So we decided we were not going to take a, one of our community meetings to do to do that. It's going to be on the day, April. 12th, I believe. I don't have it right in front of me, but we will have it in our package. So let's not concentrate on that one right now. But if you're okay with us on the second doing, we, we want to continue to have that flow of community engagement. And it seems like if we do it with purpose and have uh, some of the quality, we also learn more and the community knows what, uh, you know, what our values are and what our student uh, outcomes are too, and understand them better. So is that okay with you guys on the second? And on the second, we- um, You mean the second organized. Wednesday? No, the first Wednesday. So it'll be the, it, it would be March 2nd, right, Jen? Which is our reorganization meeting. Yes, yes, yeah. So we would do, uh, we would reorganize quickly and then have the forum or we can have the forum and then reorganize. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's a community forum. Okay, I just managed to get myself confused. I'm sorry. So in lieu of the Ed Quality Committee meeting on March 2nd, the community forum topic would be artistic expression. Got it. Yeah. Yes. So I, and there's no need to do it twice, right? Is yeah. that okay? I, I think the Quality Committee can participate and it is a community forum. And then you're, you're not presenting first to the committee. And then we would do a committee. I think that's what we had talked about, uh, Jen and Kari, right? Okay. That's what makes sense, right? Uh, okay. Did I miss some? Some. Okay. Oh no, yeah. No, I'm sorry. That has I something going on at seven thirty? Yeah. And he's gonna try to be back. Yeah. Okay. So let's move five point six. Uh, the annual Could meeting. There was. Diane also, has a oh, wait, sorry, wait. Diane. Sorry, sorry. I didn't see. Uh, so just being mindful of the fact that we're going into February break, is it, um, it, and we'll come back on the second, is that a realistic um, ask of Jen and of staff to have a, a presentation that would be in for the whole community forum idea? 
I had, um, before the superintendent search process had got, the timeline had been updated, we were, I was aiming for February. I did a fair amount of it in preparation. I have some um, snippets from some of our art and music teachers. I will admit I put it on the back burner and I just need to put it on the front burner so I can enjoy a few days off next week also, but it's completely doable. Okay, thank you, Jen. Yeah, we did, uh, yeah. Thank you, Diane, for that question. Uh, any other questions about that? And again, you know, it's part of trying to get into those routines, like if we know when, <laughs> so, but, but yeah, totally want to be respectful of staff. A preparation for the annual meeting on page 36. If you guys had a chance. So in the in the past, the annual meeting was a more of a bigger event, right? We were uh, from the floor doing the moderator and all this. We have moved to doing everything through Australian ballot. So it's, it's really just another informational meeting because it has to be 10 days. So today, the, the, it doesn't, it just doesn't count. The, <laughs> So that's why we have the informational meeting. We, I put a little bit of a proposed agenda there. It's just super simple. A call to order, a remind that it's really just an informational meeting and then discuss the proposed budget, which is basically what we just did, a presentation. But when we were brainstorming, brainstorming the other day as a steering committee, we were saying maybe we should just open it up and see depending on how many people show up. It, it might be that some people show up and we just have a conversation, just like Lindy was saying, sometimes it, our past experience is that just one or two people show up, right? So no need to do the full bloom presentation. Maybe what is more interesting is to have a back and forth with the community members uh, that come and you know, obviously have the information and make sure that we ask that question because it is an informational meeting and see if they want us to run through the presentation. Is that thumbs up? or Lindy? Uh, I guess I could have done thumbs up, but I think that's yeah, all okay. we need to do because okay. um, we're, we've shown this budget with the mail-in voting, everybody pretty much will have voted. Uh, so I think if people had questions and they showed up to ask, we're there to answer them, but otherwise I wouldn't do a full blown presentation. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, Ursula? So I noticed tonight that we recorded the budget presentation that we did separately from this meeting. And I was curious if that recording was going to be posted like on the district webpage and maybe, I don't know, links to it on like, I know most of the schools have a Facebook page. I'm just trying to like, can we hit all of the communication methods, you know, share links to like Front Porch Forum, Facebook pages for the schools so that we try to hit a wide variety of people. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're okay. hoping, yeah. Yeah. We we're hoping to share it. Why? Yeah, but it, we hadn't thought about Facebook. But we can. Yeah. We can have uh, Melissa do that. And then it. Yeah. So, is there anything else that the board would feel? And if some other board members want to participate and redo the presentation, I can also redo the the slides for others to present. But. I was gonna just leave it as it is for now. Yep, okay. So let's move on to the finance committee. I'm trying, I, I was actually gonna give us five minutes if uh, if that's okay with you, Kari? Uh, just before we move on, there's a, a piece in the packet about the Berlin town land request. And the, the thinking here was that I, I have the thought that we kind of, we voted to put it on the ballot. We have some responsibility to communicate to voters about what it is. I don't think we can rely on the town of Berlin to adequately communicate, you know, why should people should vote for it. So um, this was just a very sort of neutral, intended to be a neutral summary of what it is. And um, uh, and I I wanted to check and see, does this work? Could we, could we communicate this out via, um, you know, our various channels, or does, do people have any thoughts on how it could be improved? Chris? I thought we voted in favor of this, as opposed to a neutral. We, we voted to put it in the ballot, 
Chris, that's that's how we did it at the end because uh, when we first started to have the discussion, it, we we did not know that it needed to go on the ballot. It was until we started working the in the MOU, in the Memorandum right. of Understanding, that it came is that came up that you know it needed at that at that meeting. So so we when we voted at that we had that discussion. It, Nick brought it up. Um, and so we were I'm, all, I, I can't remember if it was Diane that said it best. It, one of you said it and said, you know, like, I feel so much better now knowing that it has to be built. It has to be voted by the entire electorate. And it's not so it helped with the members voting. Am I well, misinterpreting I'm, that or? I'm not quibbling about that, but I thought the board took the position that we were in favor of the transfer. Um uh, just because we thought it was a uh, beneficial for us and beneficial for the town, um, as opposed to not caring whether it goes through or not, and and maybe maybe we shouldn't state a position on it, um, but I thought we had. But it, but th those bullet points are there, uh, Chris. You know that no, we not, thought it I'm... was. So so the the bullet points of why it makes sense are still there, right? Did you see that? Yeah, okay. Just... So, so it's not, I, I, I don't think that we are being, I don't care. I, I think the facts are there. We don't need the land. I don't have the, the right in front of me right now, but, but, but those bullet points, they stay there. I believe Aaron was able to, to meet actually being interviewed as the principal, you know, so like we continue to be factual, just putting information out. Right. If that is. So I, I, I think that's what we can best do. Okay, I'm just, I, okay. It seemed to me that we'd taken a position, a positive position, rather than no position. And what we say here is the board has not taken a position on the request. And we, I understand that the voters as a whole because have to vote to support the transfer. Uh, but I just, I, I, I thought we'd taken a position. So that's just my opinion. So thank you. I think you're right. The points are here in terms of the, yeah. the benefits um, for why it should happen. But I thought we were pretty affirmative about it. Yeah, in, in our, I, guess in what we, I guess what we're trying to do is put the information there because as a board, we can uh, make people vote one way or another, right? That, that would be, we wouldn't, that, that's not our role, especially in, in, in this, we have to put all the information so they made an informed decision. So it's just a very thin line. I'm not trying to disagree mm -hmm. with you. It's just a very thin line of our, I don't know, our ethics as a, as a board. Uh, McKaylin and then Diane. Um, I mean, I think my recollection, Chris, is that we did when when we thought we had to decide this question, I think we did take an affirmative position, but then it came to light that we didn't have the legal authority to do that and that it needs to go to the voters. So I think it was kind of like a, a false position because we didn't really have that power. <laughs> but, I, but you're not crazy. I think we did ultimately, initially, vote well, yes. <laughs> at least on that point. Right. At that point. Thank you. Diane? Yeah, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I think, but, you know, I, th I think that the language should be changed to say that should the voters agree the board, I mean, basically, more so that we don't take a position, but the board did agree that should it be passed by voters, then we would enter into the MOU. And so that to me is an affirmative that, that I, I wonder if the wording should be changed that instead of the board not having um, an opinion on it, we do, you know, the board as a whole did approve entering into an MOU should it be passed by by the electorate. I mean, I don't agree, but that doesn't mean that, so I'm like happy with the generic language, but that isn't what we voted on. We did vote on um, entering into an MOU should the electorate agree. Okay, if I'm gonna let Ursula go and then you, Kari. I was just going to point out that we have a statement on Gloria's letter. I don't know if it's a letter. The list of statements that says that if the transfer is approved, it will be subject to the stipulation of this memorandum of understanding. And it, I assume, linked, I didn't follow the link, but it links to the memorandum of 
understanding. And it wasn't until Diane explained how she saw us like affirmatively agreeing to this that I understood where people were coming at where we said that we affirmatively agreed to it. I heard we came to a memorandum like if the voters decide this is a thing that they're okay with, we will then do this. That's neutral to me. But I mean, that's semantics. And I think that we need to stay factual, like Flores said, because otherwise it sounds like if we go, the board has decided that we should do this, it sounds way too much like telling people what to do. And it would go the other way if we said that we disagreed with it. It would feel like we are trying to influence how people vote. So I think sticking with the facts, and I thought that this was a very factual document. I thought it, it read very just factual, which I liked. Um, I think, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ursa. Uh, Kari? Uh, um, yeah, so I'm glad we're talking about this because it is an important distinction. If we if we don't have a position or are, are, are we actually recommending that the voters vote for this? I, I didn't hear that in the discussion. And I think that's the distinction. If we either are recommending or we're not. And I'm looking at the minutes and I don't, I don't see that. Lindy, just I, hold on a minute. Yeah, well, I'm looking at the minutes too. Okay, I was just going to say for clarity, instead of the school board has not taken a position, um, this decision has to be made by voters in the five towns of WCU USD, and that is why you're you'll see it on your ballot or something like that. So, so something like the board decided to to let the voters decide. Yeah. We didn't decide; it's the legal requirement. But yeah, we okay. didn't have to, I guess, take it to the voters when I Berlin think we asked did. us. Oh. I think we did. I think we did. I think that's the reason we it's on the ballot is that Luke said that we have to, it's a, a voter decision, not ours. Well, um, I know so, it's a voter decision, but as a board, yeah, as a board, we have to ever agree to even take it to the voters. Yeah. If, if, if we hadn't had, taken it to the voters, isn't that the same as us making a decision without taking it well, to the voters? Sorry. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think it should yeah. say that this decision has to be made by voters of the five towns. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that change. Thank you. Just yeah. so we're clear for the future, my understanding from what Luke said is that since we're transferring land, that's a voter decision. So we couldn't have transferred the land without the voters saying yes. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. We can't transfer the land without the voters saying yes. Okay. We right. could have said that we needed the land for educational purposes, right? So, so, so we could, so that's why we are, yeah, I, let's just keep it simple. Yeah, I don't want to okay. spend yeah, yeah. a lot of time and this. We have an MOU. We agree. I don't want to revisit yeah. the entire, uh, we have an MOU. We'll make sure that it's as clear as possible that here's the MOU, make a decision. Here's the information. Yeah. Yeah. I'll coordinate with Kari. Uh, okay. And thank you for helping me with that, Kari. Now let's have four minutes. <laughs> Or five minutes break, is that okay with you guys? And just get a quick five, yeah. Sure. yeah. We've been sitting for over, okay. Quorum with the ones here. So let's move into the finance co committee. Uh, you got some informational reports. I'm gonna, we, we gained some time because we didn't had as many people, but I still would love to be able to get everybody out of here at 8.30 and the package was really informative. So I'm just going to go super, super quickly in the, not for any disrespect, because it's really, it's a great meeting. Suzanne and Chris did a lot of work, especially for this, for this meeting. And I hope you'll have a chance to read the monthly reflections. Those are really great and gets us a great insight as board members into what is going on in the district. So are there any questions on the monthly reflections? Otherwise, I'm going to move on. I don't see any. So uh, I'm looking for uh, there's the capital improvement project update. You know, oh, Lindy, go ahead. <laughs> it wasn't that important, but I just wanted to say I had reached out during the week when I was looking at the board um, warrant packet, whatever that is. And I wanted to thank Suzanne for how quickly she got back to me with a question I had. And um, I appreciate the work that's done and put into this and the staff
being so responsive. And thank you, Lindy. And then the same for the Capital Improvement Project update. There was a great memo from Chris O'Brien. Thank you, Chris, for being here with us at this meeting too. I, I wonder if there's any questions on his memo. There's a lot happening at the school right now. I don't see any hands up. So I, what I would like to do is maybe get a motion for the clerk of the works contract. I'm looking for a motion. I can, I can read it myself if somebody doesn't have it in front. But I wonder I'm if gonna, Fred I'm going to call on Scott Fred. Thompson to read this motion. That's his last one of his last acts and deeds. Yeah, but he's not with us. He had to leave. Otherwise, oh, he did. Okay, then I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. He the had to leave at seven thirty. He's gonna try to be back, but it's not. That's why I thank board members <laughs> in the early part. But he's gonna try to come back. But if you don't mind okay, so making I'll, the motion. You I'll, move, I'll move that the board authorize the superintendent to sign the contract with WF Project Inspections uh, for his services as owner's project manager and clerk of the works through February 9, 2023, not, uh, not at a cost not to exceed $78,467. Thank you. Se seconded. Okay, so Chris and Jonas, any questions, any discussion? See none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it on to you, Chris. Policy Okay, committee. thanks. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. We have um, two policies for first reading, and these are basically um, updating policies that are already on the books uh, based on um, changes that the Vermont School Boards Association has proposed for us. And it's policy C4, um, and which is much more, as you can see, it's on page 51, it's the rev revised policy uh, and it's just much more detailed than what we had had on the books. Uh, and the second policy for first reading is B5, uh, which is also just a, a refurbishing by the uh, Vermont School Boards Association. Um, so any questions on, uh, we'll go with first with C4, which is the English learners policy. Okay, and any questions on B5, which is the prevention of employee harassment? Chris, just real quick, I didn't see any red line changes in C4. That means it's unchanged since the... It, we did not make any changes in it from the Vermont School Board's recommendation. Okay. So hearing no, um, we'll bring these back for final vote next time. Okay. The other, the other um, uh, question for a potential policy for the board's consideration is, um, was attached to the memo I sent out. And this arose because of a, a, a naming um, question that had arisen and is gonna come before us at some point in the future, we, we think. Uh, and there's apparently a petition that is circulating to uh, name the gymnasium after Dan Gandon, who is former uh, coach and teacher at U32. Uh, and because we don't have a policy on it, and we've already had a, uh, a naming for the track for Kathy Topping and Mark Chaplin, uh, we thought that we might uh, have a develop a policy just so that when questions about naming parts of the district for individuals arises, we have a uh, basically a framework for deciding it. And so this is really, I'm throwing this out, we're throwing this out for discussion and comment, um, which can occur now, or you can just email the policy committee any thoughts on, on this, um, this proposed policy. 
just to guide our decision making on this. Diane? Just, just a clarifying question. So this is a proposed policy that you would that you're putting forward for us to read. This doesn't exist currently, correct? Does not exist. And you know, the, the, Diane, the initial question is: Do you think we need this policy? Um, you know, for the board to consider is: Do we need a policy like this? Uh, and if we if we do, then what should it look like? You know, the the <coughs> in putting this together, I had in mind the. Uh, flag raising policy that we have, uh, which has very specific criteria uh, by the group that is is requesting that a flag be raised on a flagpole. Uh, and so it's just mirroring that somewhat. Um, and also incorporating a timeline for the amount of time that the naming would occur. Uh, but those are all, I mean, those are just suggestions, of course. And um, for Kari. Kari has his hand up. Kari. Uh, yeah, two, two things. One, um, I, I thought this was good. And I, I thought that it might be more explicit to say what criteria the board would actually use to make the decision. I think that's implied by what is, the, um, is requested of the person who's making the nomination. But it doesn't actually say, I don't think, that the board will use these criteria to evaluate and make a decision. I think that's important. And, and there might be some additional things in there, too, like the absence of bad acts or um, disqualifying reasons, you know, that maybe the, the nominator doesn't know about. Um, okay. So that's one thing. And then I'm just going to throw this out there and just uh, for people to think about that maybe we don't want to be in the business of naming parts of our district after people. And I say that as a person that was involved in the naming of the track, but um, there's a good example of sort of not knowing where these things lead you, you know, that we could be, or the, our future board, probably not this group of people, but could be considering all kinds of different parts of the, and just not wanting to make those decisions. I mean, it's just not worth it. Um, so anyway, I throw that out there. That and that's that's a great point. I mean, do we want do we want to be in the, the position of doing that? Um, and you know, because we the uh, the track was named um, by the U thirty two board, and when we merged, we okay. just adopted that. But we can, as a as a different board, just take the position that we are not going to uh, name. Uh, aspects of our district after after individuals. Uh, Maggie, I see your hand is up. Oh, I, I already unmuted myself. How about that? Okay. Um, so as a parent of Callis Elementary School, where there was some naming and honor outside the building that um, didn't have enough context to really, to know that person. I, I was struck in my many years as a parent there, who is this person? Uh, and you know, um, a plaque on the wall with some very limited information. So I just wonder how, if we are going to name, how we can ensure that people can appreciate how the person really contributed substantially to the, to the school communities. Um, so I'm not sure that that's, that's been done successfully um, through the generations. I mean, your, your idea about a plaque, I mean, it could be a plaque. I mean, part of the proposal here was that um, a naming that would only be for a short period of, you know, for a period of time. I think there's no definitive uh, amount of time identified, but just having the plaque saying, this is named after so-and-so uh, for these reasons. Uh, and will be in, in, in um, it will last until whenever we anticipate the deadline would be. Um, so it would be something along those lines, just uh, an, an informational plaque. Lindy? Is there a oh, sorry, go ahead, Maggie. 
Is there a finite time for the the memorials, the student memorials, like in the U32 um, atrium hallway there? And is there a way that we could, you know, extend the period e even if the person isn't currently being honored as the gymnasium or the track? So I'm questioning like for posterity's sake, how, how there's going to be a record in the long run. Um, that's a good point. Um, I wonder if, if the combination could be, because I think there's a showcase at U32 anyway, um, that has certain memorials in there. <laughs> so maybe- But we have a separate policy for that, right? So this was gonna be a, a separate, this was well, gonna be a separate policy. I think we have a, a separate policy for the memorials, memorials themselves. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the showcase though. I don't. Does that extend to the showcase that we have, where they have the there? I know there are some memorial like plaques that are in that showcase, yes. along yeah. with trophies and things like that. So I was wondering if maybe if if we're going to name something and use the plaque as a description, that after the time is up, the the plaque would go into the showcase. If, if there was a concern about a um, long-term recognition. Yeah. Lindy? Uh, one of the points that Maggie brought up about the plaque at Palace came up a little bit in our meeting because two of our elementary schools are named for individuals with Dodie and Rumney. And <clears throat> during the policy meeting, I realized, I don't know who these people are. Um, and with all that's going on nowadays of people's past and things being named for them, it was a little bit, it can be concerning of who these people were, maybe if people went back in their past or something. So that plaque at Callis, I don't know the history, but these kinds of questions are what we were discussing at the policy in what rabbit hole we're going down or what these policies might create. And I think that was part of putting this out here for people to discuss, but not for us to really make a decision, but it to be on the front burner of our decisions and where we're going as a unified board. And when the policy is made, because I know the memorials are different than the trophies um, at U32 and they fall under the policy with going forward what we can do if someone dies who is currently a student or a teacher during their time at the school. So um, this policy would be a little bit different than that and separate. But I think the input is to keep in mind where we're going with it. And if we want, you know, oh, we're eating in the such and such cafeteria and we're going to the such and such library and we're going to the such and such basement, all of those as we're moving forward. I think we need to keep that in mind as we write a policy. Yeah, I think everybody has brought really good points. So maybe if this goes back to the policy committee and they you come back to us with a policy either to not name. Nope, wait, I'm gonna stop and let Jonathan stop and then. Yeah, just just really quickly. I mean, I was part of the decision to to uh, our honor, um, you know, Kathy and Mark on uh, the naming of the track. Um, but thinking about this more long term, I think one of the best ways to honor people would be to plant a tree and include a plaque with their name or a shrub or do some landscaping or it doesn't have to be a building necessarily or a part of a building. It could be a tree that will be there for, depending on the species, potentially hundreds of years. So longer than a building will last. Let's put it that way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, so, so I think you guys have lots of ideas, but I think we do need a policy, whether, we, whether that policy says we're not naming buildings after uh, people or a policy that has a, you know, uh, similar to what you just gave us, uh, Chris, but I think one thing that is missing in this policy is just tying it in like the flag policy does into our, our mission and vision as a, as a district or some of those, it has to be a little more clear. 
the attributes. But I think if people have other ideas, to email, email yeah. uh, yes, the policy committee, uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, I mean, Jonas, you have, you're unmuted. So I, do you want to share? You didn't know if you were sure. You are muted. Oh, you're muted. Okay. okay. Is that so enough guidance? We uh, is, well, listen, can we have a straw poll as to whether or not um, we want to have a naming policy that actually does name things as opposed to we don't want to have a name, we don't want to do naming and develop a policy along the lines of saying it's going to be our policy that we don't name um, parts of the district after individuals who have served us. You know, just so just so I have a clear, we have a, the policy committee has a sense as to how the board is leaning on that that fundamental question. Jonas. Jonas. So Jonas I'll, 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 I'll just try in, um, having now successfully unmuted myself. Um, I'm okay with having a policy for, uh, for naming things or places uh, after people who have served the district, contra memorials, right? Which is a very different thing. Um, I would just want the threshold for um, a petition to be brought to the board to be very high, right? Like a significant portion of the staff um, or a really, you know, a, a significant petition from members of the community. Do you have any sense on what significant means or high means? No, I would just be pulling numbers. Okay. Thank you. I also thought in the draft that that choice of words was a little vague. What defines, I think it, it says significant. Yeah, I'd want to put a number on that. Okay. It, it, yeah, it just sounds very subjective. Thank you. Very helpful for, uh, for moving forward. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. If we're back to you. Thank you, Chris. It's a consent agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes of 119 and 222? <laughs> Do you see that? I so move, but there's a correction needed. Yeah. So Diane moves. I'll second. Thank you, Kari. And can you edit it for us, Diane? Yeah, so on page 63, it's part of that Berlin vote. Um, it says that there was one uh, no vote, but there were two. Thank you, I'll change that. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Hey, Jen. Yeah, I saw two corrections as well. Let me just get to them. On page um, 66, for the um, the COVID-19 update and the discussion, it's the, it's the second line, address artistic expression, not student expression. That was specifically related to the student learning outcomes. And then the other change was on the minutes from February 2nd. I'm listed as being present, but I was not present on February 2nd. Thank you, Jen. All those in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye as edited. Aye. 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 Any oppose? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, Lindy, or orders. <laughs> All right. Um, got it right here. I make a motion to approve the WCU USD board order of 216.22 in the total amount of $602,242.97. Thank you, Lindy. Could I have a second? Second. I think Ursula beat you. Oh, Is that right, right. Ursula? Yeah. All right. Any discussion or questions on the board orders? 
Okay. All those in favor of approving the board orders, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any I, oh, one opposed? No, it was just delay, I think. Maggie, you are okay with me? Yeah, okay. The board orders are approved. And now moving right along, we have one resignation. And Lindy, do you wanna do the honors too? I or see somebody two. else have it right in front of them? It, two there's, resignations, there's two. Um, yeah. I make a motion to accept the resignations of Mary Creedon and Emily Farinares. <laughs> Farinares? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I got that right. Um, speech pathologists at Callis and East Montpelier. Okay, Lindy moves in a second. Second. Thank you, Ursula. Okay, all those in favor? Oops, Diane, you have your hand up. So is this for next school year? Or Jen? is it for now? Jen. For, it's for next school year. So they'll, they'll be, both be with us through the rest of this year. Um, Mary Creedon is retiring, just FYI. She's been a longtime SLP in another district. Mary and I worked together at Union Elementary School, elementary school back in the early, you know, late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and Emily is uh, taking a job, I believe, closer to her home. We're gonna miss her, so. Okay, Does, any updates on vacancies, Jen? Yeah, overall, uh, no significant changes from last time. So what we still have are um, three para positions, one's at Berlin, one is at Callis, one's at East Montpelier, um, a student services position at Romney that has been open all year to support uh, behavior. Um, we will have or currently have a few long-term sub-needs, but we're working through those. Um, again, U32 driver's ed, which has been vacant. We've had that MOU all year. We have the social worker position that's currently vacant at U32. And then the special educator position that's been at Berlin that is at this point, I think just staying put, that was that instructional coach position, but um, we'll revamp and, and think through things for next year. So those are the current vacancies. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Diane, is your hand up? Yes, did we vote on accepting the resignation? Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, I moved right on onto, yeah. So moved by Lindy and second by Ursula. It approved the resignations. Please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Should we um, uh, note with appreciation to Mary since she's retiring? She's retiring, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's what we had for the meet for agenda. We have a bunch of future agenda items that we would try to uh, tackle at our steering committee meeting. We've been trying to make them smaller, but we continue to work on that. Uh, before we move into the into the board reflection, I just wanted to do a quick update. But you all received the email from me. We did a press release on February 8th after your hard work on the 2nd. We have a superintendent and we want to, you know, officially welcome. This is the first time that we're getting together as a board. And, and Megan, if you're listening to us or if you get the news, we're extremely excited to have you become part of our team. She accepted. We signed a contract. We're still waiting for AOE as usually they do the fingerprinter, fingerprinter. <laughs> they do all of the background check. And when that comes, we signed electronically. When that comes, we would have an official signing at central office in person once it's clear by, by AOE. But AOE gave us the okay to put out a press release and to sign electronically. So good job, everybody. And, and we heard from Zach, not heard, but he posted that he's taken a job in New Hampshire. In oh, he did, good. So, he did. Yeah, he posted yeah. recently and everybody wished him well. And it's so. Okay, or reflection. 
I think we did our board evaluation and we reflected, but I don't know if you guys have anything to share or appreciate. Uh, Jonas. Real quick, uh, they're not here. None, none of these three people are here, but that was the best student report we've heard in a long time. Um, I really appreciated the, the way they put a lot in and got through it quickly and in a really nice presentation. And uh, he's not here, but we really owe Scott a lot. Um, you know, he guided us through the first year. We're in a very different place than we were in June 2019. Um, and, I'll, you know, that has Scott's fingerprints and influence all over it. Um, I did not agree with Scott a lot of the time, um, but I respect the heck out of him and um, his dedication to the district, to children, to education, and to process um, is uh, just hugely helpful to getting us to where we are now. So I just wanted to make sure that um, even though he's not here, that we all had an opportunity uh, to say nice things about Scott. Thanks, uh, Jonas. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. I, before we do that, I just want to share that on behalf of the board and the entire district, we did uh, drop off uh, you know, a, a card on behalf of the district and a gift certificate uh, for them to be able to have dinner with their families. So uh, in behalf of everybody. So we did thank them all to on your behalf. Uh, Chris? Yeah, and I, I just want to echo what uh, Jonas says um, about Scott. Um, and his dedication and, um, uh, you know, it, we're not going to be as linguistically challenged anymore without Scott on the board. Um, and um, I also wanted, I, you know, I didn't realize Stephen was resigning, Stephen Luck. So I want to give a, a, a public thanks to Stephen for, uh, he, I, I saw him as kind of being a ballast at times, uh, very plain spoken, Bring us back to the um, the question at hand when we would sometimes wander in our discussion. And finally, for Jill Olson, um, I hope she will send her guffaw um, to us every so often because it was a, a joy to hear her burst out in laughter every so often um, at the meeting, and, and that will be missed. Maybe she could, she could record it and then send it in every so often. Yeah, I'll do that for you, Chris. No problem. But, but, yeah, but thank you, can you just all. Push a button. You can just push a little button, and it'll yeah, it'll come out. Yeah, <laughs> my husband would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're gonna get a, a letter of complaint from Todd saying, "Wait, now she's here all the time." <laughs> but thank you, Michaela. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say a thank you to Jen and Maria and uh, whoever else is closely involved in all this COVID, um, you know, daily changes um, that we just so appreciate what you're doing. And um, it's one of those things where it's impossible to make everyone or even probably most people happy. Um, but I just appreciate how professional and, and steady you guys have been about this. And, um, you know, just as, as the doctor in the room at the moment, um, I fully agree with what Maria said, you know, I think masks are super important, um, you know, at certain points of the pandemic. And I also think that, you know, it's important to, um, to have an off ramp, uh, with plans to ramp back up as needed. So thank you for all you're doing. It's, not an easy job, I'm sure. Um, and I also wanted to confess that it was my class at Doty who got the name changed to Doty Memorial back in like 1993, I think. I was named after the family who donated the land for the school. Thank you, McKenna. Any other board reflections? Okay, I guess we can we, we can adjourn the meeting. I, I want to say thank you again to all the administrators that came to the meeting today. Uh, thank you, Chris and Suzanne for still being here. And Jen, of course, you're always with us. So thank you for your support. Uh, oh, Diane, before I continue in my blah, blah, Diane. Isn't there a public comment still? On the yeah, agenda? but there is, yeah, I, I checked on There's, the, okay. but let's give them a, let's give them a chance before any, any members of the public that want to say something. 
they've been kind enough to be with us through i can give you an affirmative yes i'm paying attention but i have nothing to say thank you david thank you for paying attention and for being here with us and then again i just wanted to say you know goodbye to uh, to to jill and because she's still here with us and we're, we're going to miss you. I, I, I'm going to miss your, you know, like just say it as it is and bring us back in track of what it needed. A combination of you and Steven was <laughs> what we needed at times to just bring us back in track. And uh, Scott and Steven are not here with us, but like I said before, I, I've served with for many years with Steven and Luke and I've learned a lot from him too. And he carried us when we were you know, six different boards and we had an executive committee and, you know, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot. And he, it was not always appreciated as much as he should have been <laughs> back then. And I'll miss, uh, and I'll, I'll miss him uh, terribly in, in the board. He gave a sense of uh, a stability to the board. And I feel the same way about you, Jill. And I, I hope that someday, <laughs> you know, I, I know that you're just a phone call away, but you'd be there. And I, you know, Scott and I didn't always agree, but I respect his opinion. We have been working together for 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 years, and he has devoted a, a lot of attention to to our schools for many years. So I respect that and wish him well too. So with that, let's adjourn this meeting. It's even nine minutes before eight thirty. A, a motion <laughs> to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye and leave. Aye. Aye, aye. aye. and leave. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> aye. <laughs>